questions. I wanted to talk about some of the problems that we are facing right now. As we can see here in this graph, so the most of the common antibiotics that we use to treat the uh, bacterial infections today are developing antibiotic resistance. There is a problem of antibiotic resistance development. So those that we use to treat a lot of deadly diseases and save a lot of lives are not going to be effective anymore. So we need to find some alternatives. If we just look at some of the statistics there, nearly 2 million bacterial infections occur every year, causing almost 23,000 deaths per year in the US. And that actually costs almost $55 billion in the cost. That is according to the Center for Disease Control. And by 2050, 2050, antibiotic resistant infections are going to be the major cause of death, actually causing almost um, 10 million deaths per year. So I don't know how these estimates come from, but we can certainly say that antibiotic resistance problem is like a big problem that we're facing right now. So the, another issue with the antibiotics is again, they have a broad spectrum of activity. So they just don't target the pathogens that we want to target, but almost everything is killed. So as we understand more the importance of microbiome for human health and also for plants, so saving these microbiomes is another priority and finding alternatives that just target the pathogens would be an important thing to do at this point. A completely, maybe not completely, but a different story that we have a lot of plant diseases that are caused by bacteria. And so the bacteria cause disease in humans too, but there are diseases that are caused in the plants that cause a lot of economic damages, as we can see in these pictures. So one of the important plant pathogens is actually the Pseudomonas syringae, the pathogen that we work with. So this pathogen is a gram-negative bacterium that occurs almost everywhere in the environment. And it is an opportunistic plant pathogen under favorable conditions. So um, it consists of, of very highly diverse pathoverse, almost 16 numbers that cause serious diseases in a lot of different plants as you can see in the pictures here. So this bacterium has been used as a model bacterium to understand the different interactions that the bacterium does with the plants. Um, so we have a lot of these problems with the antibiotic resistance and with the plant diseases from the bacteria. But the sad thing is that these bacterial plant diseases are, we have like limited control measures to control these diseases. Um, so we have some preventive ways such as use of resistant cultivars or biological controls. Those are not always available. And um, there have been use of some copper-based bactericides or some antibiotics to control these diseases. And these are again problematic because they have again, the resistance development problem that can actually transfer to the cl clinical pathogens. And also they have off-target activity with the microbiome and also uh, phytotoxicity in the plants. So all that means that we need some alternatives to treat the bacterial diseases that we have, which are highly specific and are also effective in controlling these diseases. So now the question is, do we have these alternatives? And the answer I think is no at this point, because that's why we're talking. But we certainly have some possibilities. One of the possibility is phase therapy, in which we use bacterial phases, the viruses that infect bacteria to treat these diseases. There has been some research done with this, with some promising results, but this has not been like a commercial thing. So the other option actually are the bactericins, again, the topic of my talk today. Um, so I'll introduce the bacteriocins maybe in the next slide. So bacteriocins are ribosomally synthesized, meaning that they are proteins or peptides. 
So they have structural genes in the genomes of the bacteria that encodes these. Um, unlike antibiotics, again, which are secondary metabolites that do not have usually the structural genes to encode. So that is actually like a good, already a good tool for us, given the genetic engineering tools we have today. And they also have a narrow spectrum of um, activity, the bacteriogens. So we can say that the microbiome is actually safe with those. So these usually antagonize closely related strains. Um, so these actually provide like a competitive advantage um, in the condition of a competition with, with closely related strains. So there is a self protection mechanism for these uh, bacteriocins provided by either the immunity protein or lack of receptor in the producing cells. So nicin is a bacteriocin that is produced by a bacterium, the lactic acid bacterium, the lactobacillus lactis, that has been commercially used in food preservation, usually in the cheese industry and meat industry, to suppress the growth of the food spoiling bacteria and also some pathogens. So as we can see here, the nicin is a 34 amino acid peptide that when binds to the target cells, it actually inhibits the cell wall synthesis and also forms a pore to cause a membrane dissipation. So even, eventually the cell will die. So there are actually many different classes of bacteriocins. Um, all of them are synthesized from the ribosomes. They are some small sized uh, peptides called microcines to large protein complexes called proteins. And that is the, the topic of my talk today. But all of these bacteriocins have specific domains to target the target receptors. Um, and then some of them enter into the cytoplasma of the target bacterium, causing degradation of either the DNA or RNA. And they also, some of them have this poor farming um, ability or uh, inhibiting the synthesis of the peptidoglycans, like I saw it with the nicene before. So as I said, the telosins are the main focus of my talk today. So I will introduce telosins, which are also known as the phase tail-like bacteriocins because they evolutionarily resemble bacteriophage tails. They have like a bacteriophage here that consists of a head capsid and in the tail regions. So the telosin actually do not have the head component, but the still possesses all the components of the cells. As you can see here, the orange, uh, the tube, and it has like an outer sheath that covers the inner tube that can be yeah, contractile. And it has a structure called this base plate um, that has these tail fibers, which are actually the uh, receptor binding proteins for these tail cells. So, um, they bind to especially the lipopolysaccharides in the target cells. So they bind with the tail fibers and then when they bind, the sheath contracts. And then the inner tube actually inserts into the cytoplasmic membrane causing that pore. So the um, ions kind of move out of the cells causing membrane dissipation and death of the cells. So I'm showing like a, uh, Telosin activity assessment that we do in the lab here. So this is a line of a target bacterium, in this case, Sirona swingai pathover fasciolicola, one of the bean pathogen. Then we have like telosin particles prepared from another pathover, Sirona syringae pathover syringae. So when the target bacterium are growing in this plate, but when we spot different dilutions of telosin particles, you can see like we have like a clean clearing zone, suggesting that the growth of the, back, the target bacterium is inhibited there or the bacterium are killed. So the telosins are actually very potent killers. A single hit with the telosin is enough to kill a bacterial cell. And one bacterial cell can actually release more, almost 100 to 200 telosin particles. So they are actually potent killers not just the telosins, there are other bacteriocins which almost do the same thing. So can this be the viable 
alternatives that we are looking for. Maybe they can, but there are other issues that we need to address before we develop them into these alternatives. So some of the issues are again, we testing with the antibodies, the broad spectrum. These are usually narrow spectrum, so that problem is, I think, covered. The resistance evolution, again, is a problem with the antibiotics. So we don't know much about that with the bacteriosins. But since these are narrow spectrum, at least we will not have problem of that horizontal transfer from the other um, members of the microbiome. And the major issue here is tolerance, which I haven't talked yet. So I will introduce that in the next slide. But Tolerance to antibiotic is a problem that creates um, the infection relapse after the antibiotic treatment is stopped. So I'm actually trying to differentiate these two terms here, the resistance versus tolerance. So we have these population of sensitive cells here and uh, some random mutants that are resistant to the antibiotics. So when we apply antibiotics, the resistant mutant will survive while the sensitive cells will die. But and after, afterwards, the resistant mutant becomes the dominant member there because this has actually a heritable mutation in some of the genes associated with the, the antibiotic um, target. Tolerance, on the other hand, is a uh, phenomenon that allows these cells just to survive the treatments without undergoing any genetic changes. So you can see we have a mixed population of the sensitive and tolerant cells. The antibiotic treatment kills all the sensitive cells, but still the tolerant cells are survived. But when they go on to multiply, they still produce a population that is a combination of sensitive and tolerant. So if they survive from the treatment, they can come back and then actually cause disease. So this is actually a problem in clinical microbiology and maybe in other areas where antibiotics or these drugs are applied to treat the infections. So, yeah. so um, do you have any information about how the sensitive cells are regenerated in this uh, you know, later after the antibiotic is no longer there? Oh, so these actually are the dormant cells here, but once the antibiotics is gone, they start dividing. You know? So these are the cells that divide and then produce this new population, which has the mix of both. Um, Exactly. Yeah. So I guess. I guess what I'm what I'm questioning. Wouldn't they all be tolerant? Then? Is, is orulation counted among these tolerant mechanisms or orulation? Um, that is, I think, a an issue with the gram positives, especially. And I think that is, yeah, that is a form of tolerance that we should consider for sure. Um. In terms of the antibiotics, those also tolerate the, the spores will obviously tolerate the treatments, right? Yeah, so that is another issue that I think applies to the gram positives more. So just to go into a little more deeper, I already mentioned that the resistance is a heritable mutation. So that is actually measured with a minimum inhibitory concentration. That is the concentration of the antibiotic that inhibits the growth of all the sensitive cells. Tolerance is uh, survival under saturating condition of the treatment. It is actually measured by um, the treatment exposure times. So it can also be heritable if the tolerance occurs because of a mutation that uh, causes you know, these dormant cells. And usually the tolerance has been um, described to be caused by persistent cell formation. And in some phase related uh, things will be phase and antigenic variation. So again, this, the same thing that I said, so the resistant cells have a higher minimum inhibitory concentration. They can even survive higher concentration, higher dose of the antibiotics. But the susceptible or the tolerant cells have the same concentration, but still they survive the 
the longer duration of the treatment, as you can see here. So I mentioned the tolerance can be caused by persistence, or there's another one called phase variations. The persistence is uh, tolerance of the subpopulation under prolonged stress conditions. It is actually caused by um, the different mods, modules of the toxin and the toxin system. So this is actually responsible in causing the relapse of the treatment after the treatment is stopped. So here I'm showing this picture where the genome actually imports this toxin and antitoxin. Under normal condition, this is a complex, so the toxin is not active, but under stressful conditions, the antitoxin is degraded, so the toxin becomes free, so it kind of uh, targets the cells that inhibit the growth of the cell or the metabolism. Mm -hmm. So these cells turn into the dormant cells, which can then um, tolerate the treatment. The phase or antigenic variation is the another way that the cells can tolerate, especially uh, this is described in cells that um, are under the pressure of the immune defense from antibodies or even from bacterial phases. So our talosin particle is similar in the structure to the talosin, so that could be another thing that we have to look at. So how the phase variation actually works. So the normal condition, the cell is expressing different cell structures, like we can see here. But if they um, come under stress from the phase production, for example, they express a different form of that surface structure, which could be a LPS or other proteins. Or that can happen by mutation or recombination or maybe an on-off switch in which the promoter is reversed so that the gene is not actually expressed. So this could be another mechanism that tolerance can possibly occur with our thalosine particles. So if all these things are working, uh, then when we apply a treatment, we should see uh, dynamics of the population like this. The sensitive cells get killed right after. If we have persistence, that will survive the treatment longer. And then if there is a resistance buildup, and they go up dividing. So our question here is actually, does this thing happen with the bacteriocins too? So that is actually the question that we're trying to answer. So my research objectives are to investigate tolerance phenotype um, in the pseudomonas syringae um, upon exposure to telosin. This has been a phenomenon that has been observed by my advisor, Kevin, when he worked with these particles before. So we're trying to confirm that and then also trying to understand the mechanisms that cause these tolerances. So a brief method, we culture a phrase colony into liquid. We do a repeated culture of these colonies and then prepare a stationary culture and a log phase cultures. Log phase cultures have cells that are actively dividing while the stationary phase, the cells are almost non-dividing. So the, when, with the treatments of antibiotics, the stationary cultures have shown more tolerance than the log phase cultures, so we're doing this way. So once we have these stationary and log cultures, we treat them with the saturating um, amount of the telosin particles for the specified time, and then we get rid of the telosin particles by centrifugation and enumerate the surviving population. So those could be either resistant or tolerant. So just to confirm, we do a re-exposure of these surviving colonies. So now let's look at some results. So I have this, the number of bacterial cells at the y-axis here. So before means the number before the treatment was applied. As we can see here, there is no difference in the number of cells between the stationary and log cultures. But when we apply the telosin treatment after, uh, for one hour, we can see that there is a difference between the number of cells that survive in the stationary phase versus the log phase. In the stationary phase, we have almost a 90% reduction in the population, but still there are a lot of cells surviving while the number of cells that survive in the log phase is low, but still there is some survival. So the, now the thing to know here or to find out is 
are these resistant cells or maybe just the tolerance that I just described before. So just to confirm that we did a re-exposure. So we subculture those surviving colonies. So the re-exposure is done this way. So we have like these two different panels here. So this is for the sensitive cells. This is for the resistant mutants that have been characterized. So we spot them together either without telosin or with telosin. So we can see here that, so when we spot them with the telosin, there is no growth. So those cells are sensitive. So what, for the resistant cells, they, don't, they are not affected by the telosin treatment. So now when we do that for the, the cells that survived our exposure, we can see that there's some very few fractions that come out as resistant and most of them are actually tolerant. So now we can say that all target cells actually had tolerance to the telosins that we applied. So now to make sure whether the tolerance is like a real phenomenon, we test the stationary supernatant, whether the stationary supernatant was causing an inhibition of the telosin particles. So I prepared a filter sterilized stationary and log supernatant and a dilution of the telosin particle in those supernatants. And then again, tested their activity. Um, this picture was actually taken after some days the plating was done. So we see some of these elements dropping back. But still we can see from this picture that there was almost no inhibition of the telosin particles from the supernatant which means that the cells were not producing anything that would inhibit the telosin particles. So now again, going back to that graph I saw before, now we have cells surviving, and then we know that they are tolerant. So could these be the persistent cells? And then to find that out is to do a prolonged exposure of these with the telosin. And that's what I actually did. So when I did that, you can see that most of the killing of course within the first hour of treatment but after first hour there is almost no killing until up to maybe eight hours but after that the cells start dividing so um now those dividing cells could be resistant mutants um but we can test that by the method that i just saw and then when we did that, we actually had this sensitive population until eight hours. Most of these were present eight hours. So the eight hours treatments did not kill those cells, but they were not resistant, meaning that these cells persisted the treatment until eight hours. Um, but a 24 hour, we see like a different phenotype, which I haven't like talked before. So these are not resistant and they are not like completely tolerant. So that's why I call them intermediate. And what I mean by that is actually this. So this I have already talked, the sensitive die off. The, the resistant ones grow as much as without the telosin. But here with the, the intermediate phenotypes that I saw, so they are killed a lot with the telosin, but they still survive more than the sensitive cells. So this is kind of like an interesting um, phenotype that I saw. So um, I actually cultured them to single colonies and then prepared a uh, log case cultures, cultures that were most sensitive to the telosin treatment. And again, did this. So here we have like a, a reduction in the, the number of cells after the treatment. We have almost like a 99.9% .9 reduction with the, the sensitive cells. The tolerant population have the equal reduction, but the intermediate, although they have like more than 90% reduction in the population after the treatment, they still have more tolerance to the, than the sensitive cells. And then the, re the resistant cells are not affected, so there's no reduction in the population. So the next thing that we know that there is obviously tolerance exists with the bacteriocins. So I'm dividing this into these different populations, the sensitive that die off within one hour of the treatment. Maybe those that even survive up to four hour, or eight hour of treatment could be the persistence that we have. And then those that start growing are not resistance as shown by our re-exposure, but those could be the phase variants or maybe the mutants that 
have the mutation in gene related to a tolerance. So to understand that, our next steps are to do some cell sorting of these live cells, probably from this stage, to isolate these tolerant population and then do a live. So for the isolation, we do a live data staining followed by RNA-seq. And then maybe to do a whole genome sequencing of these, this looks like to be heritable tolerant mutants to find out the genes targets that are causing these different phenotypes. So I just want to um, talk a little about the live dead staining that we plan. So we use a kit that consists of two nucleic acid staining dyes. One is the cyto9 that uh, stains the cells in green, the popidium iodide that stains the cells in red. But the cyto9 stains all the cells, whether they are live or dead while the propidium iodide can only penetrate the cells that are dead or, or their membranes are compromised. Mm -hmm. So if you use the right proportion of these two dyes, we'll have live cells stained in green and dead cells stained in red. So using the flow cytometric tools, we can actually select those. So there is like a, a protocol to do that. So we prepare the stationary and lock phase cultures. We treat them with the telosin or with the buffer. And then we do a live dead staining and sort these live cells using the cell sorter and do a RNA-seq to find out if there is a different cell expression in the genes in the treated population versus the non-treated population. Um, so that will tell us which targets are causing these persisters, whether these are the persister mechanism that has been already described or it is a different phenomenon. So if we understand that, then we'll be able to um, maybe address this issue of tolerance. So in summary, we saw that bacteriocin tolerance is actually a real phenomenon. The stationary phase cultures tolerate more tailosin or bacteriocin than the log cultures. So we have a mix of different Populations, which could be a mix of maybe even like a physical tolerance without any physiological response of the cell, or maybe the persister formation or heritable mutants or phase variants. So, understanding what mechanisms are causing these um, tolerance will help us in addressing the potential whether. Um, like I said, if the mechanisms are the same as with the antibiotics then there might be a problem. If it is a different one, then maybe these can be actually used in combination with some of the other treatments. Even different bacteriocins may have different mechanisms of tolerance. And if that's the case, then we can actually use a combination treatment of different bacteriocins to um, fight this or to address this problem. So again, going back to that question that I had, can the bacteriocins be viable alternatives? Certainly we have problems of that tolerance, but we still see killing of more than 99% of nine percent of the cells, especially when we apply this treatment at the log phase. So timing, if we want to use those A's to control these bacterial infections, the timing might be an important thing to consider. And also um, the host response, how these respond in the actual host is not known. So we have a a graduate student, Honoria, who is studying that part. So maybe we'll have like more understanding uh, from there. So as I said, um, this could be used in combination with other treatments or even with different combination of bacteriocins could be used to maybe target these specific pathogens. So with that, I'd like to thank my postdoctoral advisor, Dr. Kevin Hockett. It has really been a very, um, good learning opportunity, so thank you. I would like to thank the Hockett Lab members, Stacy and Honoria, and our collaborator, Dr. David Palk, who's from University of Arizona. Uh, the undergrad researchers in our lab, especially Kristen Flem, which, um, with whom I'm working on a different project. Maybe I'll get a chance to talk about that sometime. And um, the Department of the Plant Pathology and Environmental Microbiology. And with that, 
I'll take any questions if you have. Okay, so that's actually a very good question. So the resistant cells are still live, so we'll not be able to differentiate whether it's like a resistant or a persister by the live data staining. But our, uh, I think our hypothesis here is that the resistant cells will be present even, so this treatment will be done for almost like an hour. So we, we do the treatment for an hour and then we do the live data staining. So those that resistant cells that are present in the treated samples will be also present in the non-treated samples too. So I'm hoping that that will not be a big difference in terms of the, the genes, gene expression. Um, but yeah, there is no way to like differentiate whether it's like resistant or persistent with the live data standing at this point. Um, we potentially could for that, but the problem is we don't necessarily know whether, we don't know if this is necessarily going to be metabolic or not. So I think one other thing just to add to what Clement said, because the majority, in the stationary phase, the majority of what we recover are not resistant, our assumption is that even with the contamination of the truly resistant cells in that population, they'll be at a low enough frequency that hopefully we can make the signal, bring what they call it, but it, it is something that we'll need to think about. Sure. So I'm curious about the, the actual infections on the plants. So what kind of uh, growth phase would you, would you associate those uh, pathogens in during infection, whether it's more similar to actually growing or stationary or some other growth phase? Um, especially at the initial phase of the infections, those I think are actively dividing. So those would be similar to what we see with the log phases. But there will be a dynamics of different populations, I think, right? So, um, so how the telecine activity will be in the actual plant experiments, that is something that is being studied and hopefully we'll have some more inputs on that, I guess. So yeah, but at this point, yeah, that could be a mix of, you know, all actually. I have one other question with um, the actual uh, synthesis of calyces. What happens to the original cell that's produced? Okay. Yeah, that's again a very good question. So, so depending on the type of the bacteriocin, some of these bacteriocins are secreted out of the cells, but these telocins are actually, they lyse the cells once they are released. So this is, I was reading like a review that says uh, microbial altruism something. So the release of these telocins actually provides advantage to the, let's say the sister cells or the siblings that are there. So, but yeah, the cells is actually killed once the telocins are released. Yeah, maybe. It seems that, uh, I think so. So there has been some research actually even um, our group has shown that switching the receptor protein can change the target specificity. So that certainly is an area that I think we can take advantage of. Um, there are a lot. I don't exactly know the, the number, but... Uh, Yeah. So, yeah. So um, it depends on what organism you're looking at. So if you're talking about something like E. coli, probably most of them are known as a fair amount of diversity there, but it is constrained to a certain degree. The problem is for most of the databases, uh, for the thalicin that we're working on specifically with this, there are similar structures found in a number of different organisms. They're not going to be picked up by any traditional program. We actually have to find them 
with the phage prediction program and then go in and see if it's not actually interesting. Um, right now, there's just no good way of predicting some of the small things. Um, but there's, there's quite a bit in terms of diversity. Level. But the ability to exchange between, say, microsins and palosins, probably that's not going to work. The targeting mechanisms will be across that number. But this task is really related to the development of this type of so we can relate to this by only the same bacteria mm -hmm. that will bring the immune system uh, to bind to this type of bacteria and mm -hmm. so we produce a bacteria to address the same idea in competition like this can be applied to the bacteria. Yeah. Okay. So the tailosin particles. So in the lab condition, the tailosins, like with the bacteriophages, are expressed under a stressful condition of the DNA damage. So we apply these target cells with a chemical known as mitomycin C, and we have a lot of different steps that we can actually purify these cellulosin particles almost in the pure form, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's, we could do a crude prep where we just filter sterilize and do it that way. Or um, for a lot of what kind of showed here, you can do pig precipitation, which will pull out just the large compounds. Um, you lose most of the other proteins so that can break, so it's roughly pure. So I was wondering, from your perspective, is Tolerance necessarily a bad. From the perspective of, <clears throat> it seems like it would be uh, a pathway that would inhibit it, inhibit resistance formation, because if you're taking down the population 99.9% of the tree, and say you get a couple resistant cells pop up, but 10 times as many tolerant cells pop up, they're now going to dominate the recovery population and not allow the resistant population to take over. So especially if you can get it down far enough that the host can deal with the rest of it and you've prevented resistant populations from taking over from the few that survive, that maybe a good thing to have some problems. There. Well, um, maybe, because, but the uh once that takeover, I think, would be still the resistant ones because they will start multiplying. Yes, if you get, well, so like, when you look at your curves there. Sorry, yeah. If you went out to that eight hour, so it starts recovering, those are all resistant cells pretty much, or maybe some of these mm -hmm. too. But if you would, so maybe the, the trick with these would be then to stop your treatment a little earlier. If you get most of that killing in the first hour, but you don't get the resistance until eight hours. If you stop it at two hours, then you'll have some tolerant cells left, but they're going to still then be again susceptible if you have to redo the treatment. Uh, so just be like a different sort of treatment protocol. So one of the things that is often used in, in disease management, lots of different systems, is incremental um, attacks. Right. So you don't you don't try to use one material or approach to kill something. You maybe you use this and then after four to six hours you use something else, something, something else. And that way um, you don't ever have resistance build up to one thing. And um, it's that incremental management that will keep it below the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then you've got a second material that keeps it. Um, mm -hmm. so uh, mm -hmm. right. Well, yeah, that's what, like, especially, so obviously I tend to think things more from like a human perspective and stuff too. So in that situation, too, if you could, because it's very difficult to totally eradicate stuff, mm -hmm. and usually you get all kinds of collateral damage that when you try to. But if you could take it down so that there was just the tolerant rather than resistant cells there, that would be a lot better outcome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Um, if you can help me, that's <laughs> um, so the answer is for this tail in particular, we haven't looked at it, um, we haven't done those sorts of experiments for other related tail cells. Uh, they tend to they're they're good against proteases, they'll resist um, that. So, like, bacteria will secrete proteases pretty regularly, which will degrade other bacteria since fairly regularly. Um, these, depending on the temperature, they're fairly stable. We haven't actually, I'm not sure about pH and within the normal temperature range that you would expect in the field, they're pretty, pretty stable. So the ones that we have in the lab, we have stocks that we've made, you know, not in the lab here, but previously I've had a stock that I made and remain stable over years. But of course that's in a buffer system in the refrigerator, so it's, it's going to be a little bit better in that sense. So the, yeah, under a under a normal condition out in the field, that's a good question. in the field is that you would actually apply the producer. Yeah. And um, there are lots of ways of doing that that allow them to be safe. Mm -hmm. The producer doing it is well, the last of Yeah, it would actually produce them. And one of the major issues there as well is that economics of producing protein, it would use at a field scale, just that's not going to be feasible in terms of um, payoff for the growth. And so it also gets at the idea of the populations you actually want to control. You don't need to grow the whole wheat, right? You really just want to, and the certain areas where we know that there's substantial growth that leads to the population that can invade. If we have a producer cell, then we know that we're probably going to get the production in those locations and we're not coding 90% of the surface area that we don't need to coat because it's not an issue. And the other strategy, when, like when I think about biocontrol, which is a project, I think you know we're looking at seedborne diseases and uh, treating seed is different than treating a whole field. Mm -hmm. right. Right. Mm -hmm. For resistance cells, do you know if in the genome they have to be integrated to give it to some kind of biogenic bacteria? Mm -hmm. So if you have a sequence and you have to be the baby phase, please that make the same things. I don't know if I understand the question correctly, sorry. Do, do the, so if I understand it, for the resistant cells, do they have a page integrated yeah. that confers some resistance yeah. to the female cell? Um, so yeah, that is an interesting point, but in our case, because I don't think there is a possibility that the phase can integrate it integrate at this point, but in a natural environment that I think could be an and that would that would largely come about. So the resistant means that we do recover, we check their they all affect LPS biosynthesis genes. And when we look at the O antigen, the O antigen is significantly different uh, compared to the wild type strain for the bona fide resistance to it, you know, they don't care about the types of so in that case, if you were infected, if a cell were infected by a phage that had a serotech conversion module, then you could expect that that would be the resistance to the phage. But simply, it's not the same resistance as um, blocking super infection because there's no replication going on. So as long as if the, if the LPS itself doesn't change based on the phage infection, then the tail is not going to Okay. Yeah, so that, that brought to mind uh, another question that I had about if you have any hypotheses about what is going to be the mechanism of replication. Is it phenotype? Do you think this is also just a less dramatic O antigen change? Uh, but then it, does, it doesn't seem to, they don't come out 100% immediately again in the next population. So you wouldn't think this 
necessarily messy? Or is it, do they have, um, so does a given string have multiple points that lever that they can switch between or uh, or capsule would be another I think they have, right? They have different O antigens that they, they expose to the surface. So that, that I think is one of the possibility why we see these intermediates. Because again, if it's like a phase variation kind of thing, they can like switch back and forth. So we'll have like a mixed population of both the variants and the non. So that's why we get some killing and still some survival. But I think the uh, another thing is like, maybe there's like a mutation in not like exactly the receptor, but some genes that, you know, kind of like slow down the growth of the cell or something. But yeah, that will, yeah, will, I one, think, sorry. One other thing that I would just add to that, I'm putting together a couple different bits of data. One thought would be that it may, the tailism itself may not actually be targeting the formed going to the but it may be targeting the going to the before it's completely formed. And one reason why we think that might be is because um, in another uh, collaboration with my, my previous advisor, um, what we found is that there are thalosins that will target very widely divergent strains. And so, it may, you know, we've got uh, 13 phyla groups within the species and it may target strains from different phyla groups. But Previous work that's been done by other groups has shown that the O antigen is actually quite variable across that sort of phylogenetic space. And so, how is it that it would target these different strains? Maybe they have the exact same O antigen, or maybe there's just an intermediate um, in the synthesis that is getting killed. Yeah, so, that, that could be another explanation for what is going on. Thank you for one more time. Thank you.